And so I'd like to start um, by introducing again uh, Judith. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Judith Goldman to the Aurora Philosophy Institute. I think Judith is well known uh, to most of us. Uh, uh, of course, uh, she is an associate of the API and, uh, and has been a frequent uh, participant in these uh, Tuesday Philosophy Club meetings uh, with, when, other, when we've had other speakers. Uh, Judith, as we just learned, uh, um, uh, well, I already knew it, uh, Judith holds a PhD from Columbia University and she is currently director of the Poetics Program at the State uh, University of New York at Buffalo. Um, she has a particular interest uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment. Not a particularly good day for that. There was not much enlightenment at Hampden Park, uh, you know, this afternoon. They lost 3-1, you know, to Croatia. Still, you know, what can you do? And uh, nonetheless, on that theme, the topic is uh, narrative in Adam Smith. Judith. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'm going to share screen, everyone. Um, so get ready for that. And uh, let me see. Sorry. Okay. So uh, the title of my talk is Visible Hand, Trials and Tribulations in the Narratives of Adam Smith. And um, before I begin, I would like to thank my dear friend and mentor, Joanna Picciotto, who's here. Um, she's an early modernist and Miltonist in the English department at UC Berkeley. And she was extremely helpful and supportive when I wrote my dissertation on Adam Smith uh, 14 years ago. Um, and also my, my very patient partner, Damien Keane, who's an Irishist and radio study specialist in English at SUNY Buffalo. And of course, John Smith, and who in introduced me to the Aurora Philosophical Institute and invited me to give this talk. And I'm really uh, delighted to be here. And thank you all for being here. Um, and finally, I just want to say without this seem, seeming any kind of a gendered apology, I do want to note that I'm returning to this material after a very long time. So uh, oddly enough, my academic life involves me being a poet and critic of contemporary literature and not a philosopher or 18th century scholar. So I'm a little rusty with this material, but I've really enjoyed getting back into it. And as we potentially get to questions later, I hope there can be a wider discussion among us, as I know a number of you are very familiar with the materials that I'm going to discuss. So I'll give a, a brief outline of my talk. Um, so I'll be defining social systems and the philosophical systems that describe them, the human natural system as a riddle, and the invisible handed explanation. Um, the next section of my talk is about the disciplinary breakthroughs of Smith's wealth of nations as an invisible handed narrative and its narratological problems. And I have two examples that we'll go through. Um, so example one is from early drafts um, of the Wealth, Wealth of Nations opening gambit on the leisured and laboring classes and how Wealth of Nations has these bravura showpiece riddles that rewrite and redirect this problem. Um, then the second example has to do with the many inconsistencies and in causal reasoning with regard to the priority of exchange over the division of labor. And I think that's probably all that we'll have time for. Um, when I get to the 45 minute mark or so, I'll, I'll be wrapping up um, maybe slightly longer than that. I had a conclusion about Marx's misreading of vicious circularity and the wealth of nations, which actually Smith was well aware of. And um, if anyone wants to ask about that in q and I'd be happy to talk about it further. Um, so just to start right in. The system was a highly favored Western European didactic or expository genre in the 17th and 18th centuries. Though it is not often noted, there is a wide variety of subgenres within this genre. There are published systems for setting up fisheries or for teaching algebra, as you can see here. But the system with the greatest intellectual capital was the philosophical system that sought to explain what I call human natural systems. And it was this form of system that became the foundation of the social science disciplines. This was Smith's favorite genre. Unlike his friend Hume, for instance, he did not write brief essays or dialogues. All of his works were systems and all of, almost all of them were systems of this specific kind. So first, let me back up and define a human natural system. 
which I will in turn show are specially bound up with the philosophical written systems explicating them. The social science of this time took for granted the ontology of human natural social systems. The complex figure system was used to conceive relations between and among individuals as part of a larger social unity. Uncoordinated distributed actions undertaken by individuals in society contribute functionally to group processes that reciprocally enable them and in which they are inescapably enmeshed. A social system is the resulting meta circuit of activity that comprises the sum total of human activities in a given domain, say moral philosophy, a larger whole that is self-regulating in its integrated components, in that its integrated components exist by virtue of their system sustaining interrelation. Social systems are historical, imminent to the dynamics of life and society as those dynamics change over time, and systems embody felicitous optimal arrangements for preserving human life at each step of a society's progress. <clears throat> So why are they human natural? Systems are human natural in the sense that they inevitably emerge in the natural course of human interaction as a result of the operations of universal principles of human nature. And they are human natural because unlike mechanical or organic systems, though they are often compared to these, they depend on what we're seeing as uniquely human capacities, for instance, of imagining, comparing, and normalizing behavior. Most importantly for my purposes here, seen through the lens offered by the philosophical system, human natural systems come into view as seductive and enig enigmatic riddle-like objects. Arising through human natural causes rather than conscious designs or external directives, systems are the necessarily unintended results of human behavior over the long course of the development of human society. They seem designed, yet are undesigned. They seem purposively coordinated, yet are non-coordinated. Moreover, their holistic autopoietic form, in their holistic autopoietic form, they are closed totalities. Inputs require outputs. As Jean-Jacques Rousseau famously stated in his treatise on the origins of language, man clearly needed to have had language to create language. Given this circular dynamic and the tightly interwoven interdependent relations among components, how did any such system originate? The systemic integrity itself makes puzzling out the origins and developments of the system something of an intellectual feat. Further, the philosophical system not only presumed upon the existence of human natural systems, but also assumed that they each were grounded in a single fundamental principle of human nature. Part of this has to do with emulating Newton's astoundingly elegant theory of physics with its single principle of gravitation. But note that this supplied yet another enigmatic aspect to the conundrum of system. What simple fundamental principle of human nature can give rise to such a complex structure as a system? Philosophical systems like Smith's set themselves the formidable task of solving these riddles. They were so ambitious that they did not merely offer a synchronic explanation of the dynamics of the system, but in fact desired to supply a genetic account that would demonstrate how they had originated and developed over time. Again, most importantly for my purposes here, such philosophical systems were in turn articulated according to the very stringent conventions of formal composition that I follow Edna Ullman Margalit in calling the invisible hand narrative. And in fact, as I see it, fulfilling the conventional criteria for an invisible handed explanation is what guaranteed or authenticated the scientific nature of these early forays into social science. As Ullman Margellet discusses, these explanations delight in their paradoxical formulations such as undesigned design and in unraveling the very contradictions that they propose. Importantly, their very telling takes this into account. Not only do such stories formulate causal mechanisms that may unobtrusively aggregate behavior such that it results in seemingly intended yet unintended cooperation, but the narratives through which such explanations unfold themselves recapitulate that mysterious transmogrification. If actors within the worldly system described participate in social systematicity without seeing that they do so, 
so too do the authors of written philosophical systems purposely narrate the phenomena to be explained through veiled descriptions that suspensefully withhold their systemic teleology until it is finally revealed. As I argue, as I argue, this means that the philosophical system is a highly interactive self-conscious text that depends on building rhetorical traction with its reader. Likewise, these texts not only narrate obliquely in order to maximally energize their revelations, but they also found their narratives with original principles and conditions that seem highly improbable or unconducive to producing the salutary unintended consequences that they do. For instance, Bernard Manville's Brumbling Hive positively drips with pleasure in his counterintuitive, devilishly clever proposals that not only is it self-interest that ultimately generates the economic health of a common meal, but that it is specifically vice, all forms of hedonistic indulgence and in crime that makes for economic virtue. Throughout all of Smith's texts, we find cues alerting us to the surprising and probable probability of his accounts constantly refuting common sense, yet also offering solutions that seemingly inarguable in their intellectual view. I also argue that Smith's narratives draw on Aristotle's formulations of the generic constraints of Greek tragedy. What makes an invisible handed narrative integral is the causal enchainment between events of the story. Each, episodes develops, each episode develops because of what came before it. While this causality is situated in a given human society, able to interpret and gauge the probability and rationale of human actions. Further, Greek tragedy turns on a misperceived action in which the protagonist intending to do one thing accomplishes another. In Antigone, Creon seemingly righteously forbids Antigone to bury her brother as religious custom requires because he is a traitor. And yet horrific events unfold as a result, revealing that his lawfulness is punishably unlawful. Smith drew on examples from tragedy and their improbable descriptions of, fall, of the fall from fortune to misfortune in various discussions um, in, for instance, theory of moral sentiments. But more importantly, he innovated on the ironic structure of unintended consequences in tragedy whereby seemingly atomized actions are concatenated into a resulting system. Here, unintended consequences do not cancel or reverse the identity of actions in so much as their collateral fallout contributes positively but unknowingly to an undesigned design. I formulate my case for the above as Smith's, um, as Smith's, in the absence of Smith's methodology or any explicit methodological statements on system building that he himself wrote. There are comments throughout his oeuvre, but nothing, nothing really explicitly stated. And I would be glad to discuss my own speculative metho methodology further later, as well as why I called my dissertation visible hand after Smith's invisible hand and why I see this trope as generally wildly misinterpreted. Further, there's a huge amount to say about the semi-suspended truth status of conjectural history or the narratives of origin built in, that are built in philosophical systems, as well as Smith's use and abuse of other kinds of evidence and what counted as empiricism in the human natural sciences in this period. I don't discuss that here, but I would be glad to address it further later. Okay, so I'm going to discuss a concrete example of what I've been laying out by looking at Smith's Wealth of Nations and reading it against the grain. And I'll lay out here uh, briefly what I mean by that. So let's begin with a description of Smith's theory of moral sentiments and also of the Wealth of Nations by one of his contemporaries, Dugald Stuart, who wrote um, Smith's Eloge, uh, which is a long form of obituary upon his death. He emphasizes the holism, integrity, and elegance of these theories. They embody the very epitome of an of a, um, explanatory system. So here he's talking about um, the theory of moral sentiments, um, how he gives a systematical arrangement to the most important discussions and doctrines of ethics, and may be justly regarded as one of the most original efforts of the human mind in that branch of science. Um, here he talks about how the wealth of nations has tackled 
Um, it's an analysis of singular difficulty involving by far the most complicated class of phenomena that can possibly engage our attention. Usually, um, we're just filled with passive emotions of wonder and submission before economic phenomena, um, similar to right, the mysteries of physics. Um, he talks about the obsessive holism of Smith's texts. Um, so he says, for it is only when digested in the clear and natural order that truths make their proper impressions on the mind, which is of course what Smith's texts accomplish. And also this idea that Smith considered every species of note as a, a footnote, right, as a blemish or imperfection indicating either an idle accumulation of superfluous particulars or want of skill and comprehension in the general design. So there's this constant obsession with totalizing um, holism um, in the text. Um, so in response to Dougald Scort and with Stuart, and with, of course, the benefit of 250 years of hindsight, the first thing I will note about the wealth of nations is that there are a number of deep incoherences in the work. For instance, between its opening conjectural history of the development of commercial society and the stadial theory of economic development offered later in the text and the well-known historical materialist model whereby societies human naturally evolve from a hunter-gatherer economy to shepherding, to agriculture, to industry. Similarly, the opening book builds a static equilibrium model of economics, while later books are still somewhat inchoately developing a dynamic disequilibrium model with all of its potential for what Joseph Schumpeter um, famously labeled creative destruction. So in observing this, my purpose is not to tear down the work. In fact, to me, this incoherence, while of course it signals a certain lack of control over the discourse, is also part of the fecundity and imagination of this amazing book. Discrepant threads of thought found here have been productively developed in many different directions by economists moving forward. Part of this incoherence also has to do with the fact that The Wealth of Nations was written over a very long period of time. And by book three, Smith had encountered the theory of the French physiocrats etc. So here I'll keep my remarks to book one of the Wealth of Nations, um, and this is called his Principia, as his contemporary so admiringly referred to it, comparing Smith to Newton, who had the status of a god. Smith chose the division of labor as the foundational human natural causal principle to ground wealth creation. For Smith, everything turned on this one principle, the division of labor. It was a concept that had already assumed a massive importance in economic theory. And the opening chapters of The Wealth of Nations continually subtly redefine it to construct not only an exceptionally rigorous genetic narrative of how the capitalist system could have come into being, but also an account that was an invisible hand explanation. The division of labor is an alluringly paradoxical mechanism that at once separates, but also connects individuals and society. As Smith compellingly represents its operation, it produces both the systematicity of human work and the ever-growing multiplication of its fruits and the determinant absence of any conscious intention to create such a felicitous collective arrangement. The conjectural history Smith offers in the first few chapters of Wealth of Nations um, constitutes a breakthrough from his peers' economic thought on several fronts. So here are some of the breakthroughs. First, it scrupulously theorizes the preconditions necessary to the origin of the division of labor. Second, it does so without any appeal whatsoever to a social division of ranks. Here Smith accomplishes an important disciplinary innovation. Instead of implicating a narrative of the human natural rise of wealth creation within a narrative of the human natural rise of property law defending an unequal division of wealth created, he reverses the priorities of earlier theorists and deftly extracts the latter issue from the initial parts of his inquiry altogether. The field of economics, the scientific study of the human natural system of opulence producing labor comes into its own. Smith rigorously excludes disparities in wealth from this history because such a factor would presuppose an accumulation that his story will show or supposedly that labor brings about. Significantly, however, in a third in innovation, he further repressed both political power and specifically economic political power from his narrative so that his story would account for the separation of work and the absence of any purposive systematizing of it altogether. No one had ever done this before. 
What I am arguing is that in an ultimate irony, these very choices also led to incorrigible causal problems that in fact prevented him from creating a coherent narrative, moving smoothly from one step to the next. Book one of The Wealth of Nations has consistently been taken as exemplary of invisible hand explanations. And here is a list of the chapters with their topics. Um, that, and this is not a complete list of book one, but this is all that I discuss. Um, but it continually hiccups, contradicting itself, revising itself, interrupting itself, and suggesting other trajectories of inquiry, stalling at impasses, and simply ignoring them. In my dissertation, I really dug into these problems. In addition to comparatist historical work, whereby I evaluate how Smith changed the framework of political economy, and formalist readings of how Smith's work fails to embody its strict generic conventions, my method of interpretation of Smith's texts also participates in what is called genetic criticism, that is tracing how a given text was composed by looking at drafts, and we'll do some of this. So there is certainly um, no space to discuss all of the problems in the narrative here, but I do want to list them, and then I'll focus on a couple as examples to discuss more closely in the remainder of my talk. So by looking at drafts, we can see how Smith labored to jerk into place an opening gambit, a rhetorical framework that would set up his treatise, posing riddles revolving around the division of labor. He ends up deflecting questions around the causality of rank or class disparity through these suggestive, distracting paradoxes, which depend on various logical fallacies. Secondly, Though in book two of Wealth of Nations, the capitalist organization of labor is depicted very differently, in the first chapter of book one, in his famous analysis of the microdivision of labor at the level of the firm, in the plagiarized example of the pin factory, Smith purposely and untenably eliminates all mention of the coordination of the process of manufacture. Of, of manufacture, such that wonderfully exponentially productive industrial labor seems to occur invisibly, invisible handedly without masters. Throughout this discussion, Smith elides this micro division of labor with the social division of labor among trades, making it seem to work on the same principle of the anarchical yet felicitous distribu distribution of men among all the professions under capitalism. This point is important and so far as many eminent readers of Smith credit him with nascently theorizing and illustrating these different forms of the division of labor. That is the micro division of labor in the firm, the industrial division of labor that's organized by an entrepreneur <laughs> and the social division of labor. In fact, I see him as perceiving the distinction, but also manipulatively erasing it in his text. In other words, the extraordinary number of pins produced in the factory setting comes to look like a passively organized unintended consequence rather than the effect of entrepreneurial, highly planned and disciplinary management. More, more problems. With regard to drafts, but also within Wealth of Nations itself, Smith seems unable to settle on the originary state of relations amongst humankind. Is there autonomy or, inter or interdependency between men? Which version of an essential human nature would be more, will be most conducive to producing the division of labor, that is autonomy or interdependency? Bound up with these anthropological concerns is Smith's well-known postulation in chapter two of the unique human aptitude for exchange as the driver of the division of labor. But not only does Smith admit that exchange functions in his argument circularly as both the precondition and the result of the division of labor, but when we look at the drafts, we see that Smith in turn fascinatingly theorized man's extreme affective investment in persuasion as the impetus behind exchange itself which ultimately strangely libidinalizes all economic activity. People really just wanna persuade each other. Smith also strangely interrupts the story he's telling in book one in chapter three with a discussion of the effects of shipping on the development of specialized labor. Later in chapter seven, Smith argues that the degree of the division of labor and its distribution amongst the trades depends on the limit or extent of the market. 
according to the homeostatic model of that opening book. But in chapter three, water carriage suddenly allows for the expansion of the market and becomes a driver of the further specialization or division of labor. In other words, he introduces what might be seen as an exogamous component into his invisible handed narrative, whose surprising solution should instead be based solely on a given set of fixed circumstances and a way of reconceiving them so that we can see both their local effects and their system producing results, not through the introduction of a DSX machina like water carriage. <laughs> so much later in book three, when Smith considers the complementarity in the production process of the economic sectors of agriculture and industry and industry and their relative ontological priority, right? Agriculture has to precede in industry. He presumes upon a normative landlocked scenario. So clearly then the advantageous proximity to water discussed in this early chapter also threatens the universality of the human natural economic model. Final final part of the list of problems. In chapter two, Smith shows how the advent of the market allows the division of labor to come fully to fruition, in which exchangers exclusively pursue specialized labor based on their market expectations. But what is the market's origin? While on one hand, Smith portrays it as a gradually developing structure, on the other, he depicts it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, it makes possible the coordination of specialized labor, right? People make things and exchange them with each other and it all works out perfectly. What makes possible the coordination of specialized labor that has no coordinating center is the presupposition that it will be coordinated without being coordinated. It is the very belief in the certainty of impersonal market exchange that generates the market. In other words, the invisible handed system is precipitated precisely by participating in agents acting on the understanding that a system operating invisible handedly has already been instated. And finally, in yet another term in chapter four, it turns out that this market scenario as a means of dialectically developing the division of labor must also be revised. Barter is a terrible mechanism for exchange and would never allow the division of labor to develop fully without the placeholder of money, which in Smith's story also comes into being invisible handedly. Um, let me just say, Garden, there are a lot of really long slides um, because Smith is just incredibly prolix. The Wealth of Nations is a thousand page book. <laughs> so I tried to cut the text as much as possible, but so that you could still see the, the evidence here and, and share it with me. But I, I realize these, these uh, slides are very, have very long text on them. I, may, I tried to make the print very big. Okay, so we're going to look first at early drafts to see how invested Smith was both imposing riddles revolving around the division of labor to set up his system and how he dwelled on discrepancies in rank in these riddles when he was first setting things up in his drafts. So then we will also see how Smith dramatically revises these passages in the final version of Wealth of Nations, sublimating and managing the question of disparities in wealth through several plagiarized rhetorical showpieces featuring paradoxes based on logical fallacies. So just by noting the pointed title of again Rousseau's second discourse on the origins of inequality, we can see that the focus of analyses of wealth at this time involved fabling its unequal dispensation, whether from a stance critical of that dispensation or as a rationalizing and buttressing of it. In the early drafts, Smith's emb Smith embarks on a speculative history in which the origins of the division of labor and the division of length, ranks, excuse me, specifically the distinction between the leisured and laboring classes, remain intertwined. In dwelling on class disparity, he begins to tell the wrong story and to write the wrong polemic. So here's from, um, here's from his, uh, oh wait, why is that that slide? Hold on one second. Okay, we wanna be on this slide, sorry. Um, 
And I wanted you also to note how all of these passages reveal the, con the economist's heavy investment in the rhetoric of paradox and improbability. So he's saying what we should expect and then how what he's going to deliver is counterintuitive or highly improbable and surprising. Right? So he's going to you know, develop these surprises out of um, the things that he's postulating. And it says, though the whole point of science is to formulate claims that are wonderful or surprising to produce insights that prove a counterpoint to what we might naturally expect based on forms of experience that are pure realism or rhetoric. So in the early drafts, he says, among savages, every individual enjoys the whole produce of his own industry. There are among them no landlords, no usurers, no tax gatherers. We might naturally expect, therefore, if experience did not demonstrate the contrary, that every individual among them should have a much greater affluence of the necessaries and conveniences of life that can be possessed than, than can be possessed by the inferior ranks of people in a civilized society. In early drafts, again, it is very easy to conceive that the person who can at all times direct the labors of thousands to his own purposes should be better provided with whatever he has occasion for than he who depends upon his own industry only. But how comes it about that the laborer and the peasant should likewise be better provided is perhaps not so easily understood. In a civilized society, the poor provide both for themselves and for the enormous luxury of their superiors. And one more uh, passage here. Um, this is from uh, lectures, his lectures on jurisprudence. It may not indeed seem wonderful that the great man who has a thousand dependents and tenants and service, servants who are oppressed, that he may live in luxury and affluence, that the moneyed man and man of rank should be so very affluent when the merchant, the poor, and the needy all give their assistance to his support. It need not, I say, seem very surprising that these should far exceed the greatest man among a whole tribe of savages, but that the poor day laborer or indigent farmer should be more at his ease, notwithstanding all oppression and tyranny, than the savage does not appear so probable. So we can see that this is all um, this <laughs> putative comparative anthropology where the um, right, the, the savage chief, the savage king, right, this um, sort of obscene, uh, primitivizing, orientalizing figure um, is seen as, you know, not enjoying the quality of life as the average laborer. Um, let me just change the slide. So here, so at the end here, supposing therefore that the produce of labor of the multitude was to be equally and fairly divided, each individual we should expect could be little better provided for than the single person who, who labored alone. But with regard to the produce of the labor of a great society, there is never any such thing as a fair and equal division. And here he really starts getting into it. In a society of 100,000 families, there will perhaps be 100 who don't labor at all and who yet either by violence or by the more orderly oppression of law employ a greater part of the labor of society than any other 10,000 in it. The division of what remains too after this enormous defalcation is by no means made in proportion to the labor of each individual. On the contrary, those who labor most yet least, the poor laborer who has the soil and the seasons to struggle with and who while he affords the materials for supplying the luxury of all the other members of the commonwealth and bears as it were on his shoulders, the whole fabric of human society seems himself to be pressed down below ground by the weight and to be buried out of sight in the lowest foundations of the building. In the midst of so much oppressive inequality, in what manner shall we account for the superior affluence and abundance commonly possessed even by this lowest and most despised member of civilized society compared with that most respective and that the most respective and act, active savage can attain to. <laughs> so <laughs> he's protesting too much, right? It's tempting to surmise that Smith perhaps almost wrote a very different book. And in this last picture uh, passage in particular, social rank is not an invisible handed affair, but something that is programmatically and violently imposed by centralized powers. I mean, this is not an invisible handed narrative. 
Smith indeed seems to initiate an excavation of the buried foundations of a current fabric or system of the division of labor in which the story told would have this lowest and most despised member of civilized society as its protagonist. But instead, he refines the narrative strategy of his inquiry such that in Wealth of Nations, he succeeds in a very specific work of abstraction, that of uncoupling a discussion of the division of ranks um, from one of the division of labor. So um, here's what happens in the opening pages of the final text. In the introduction, Smith announces that his agenda in the first book of the treatise will be to inquire into the causes of this improvement, to inquire into the causes of this improvement and the productive powers of labor and the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks and conditions of the people. But this is something of a rhetorical snare as we see in the first chapter. Without the assistance and cooperation of many thousands, the very meanest person in a civilized country could not be provided, even according to what we very falsely imagine, the easy and simple manner in which he is commonly accommodated. It may be true perhaps that the accommodation of a European prince does not always so much exceed that of an industrial and frugal peasant as the accommodation of the latter, that is the industrious and frugal peasant, exceeds that of many an African king, the absolute master of the lives and liberties of 10,000 naked savages. And, um, you know, I, I apologize for the, I mean, it's really obscenity of this, this, this absurd language in the, the putative comparative anthropology. So, let's go back here, sorry. So here Smith has reworked his earlier drafts of these passages into a full-fledged paradox whose rhetorical and logical burden has distinctly shifted. This sensationalist improbable comparison between improbable, right, surprising comparison between wage labor and African king not only supplies a rhetorical traction or momentum of contradiction that lays down a red carpet for a system building explanation that will unravel the riddle, but it also, of course, displaces the question of class discrepancies in his own society. And it conflates quality of life with the complexities of non-cooperative cooperation and commodity production. So now for the second riddle of the first chapter, and this is a very famous passage, and it is also more or less plagiarized from Mandeville. So just prior to the passage we just discussed and as part of its strategy, Smith has introduced his quite famous bravura depiction of common commodity production through a global network of circulation and exchange. And again, it's taken from Manville, more or less. Here we get the workman's coat as a riddling enigmatic object. So he says, observe the accommodation of the most common artificer or day laborer in a civilized and thriving country. And you will perceive and I think he must mean this figuratively because you can't literally see this whole system that he's discussing, you will perceive that the number of people whose industry a part, though but a small part, has been employed in procuring him this accommodation exceeds all computation. The woolen coat, for example, which covers the day laborer as coarse and rough as it may appear, is the produce of the joint labor of a great multitude of workmen the shepherd, the sorter of wool, the wood, wool comber or carter, the dyer, the scribbler, the spinner, the weaver, the fuller, the dresser, with many others must all join their different arts in order to complete even this homely production. How many merchants and carriers besides must have been employed in transporting the materials from some of those workmen to others who often lived in very distant parts of the country? How much commerce and navigation in particular how many shipbuilders, sailors, sailmakers, rope makers must have been employed in order to bring together the different drugs made by use of the dyer, which often come from the remotest corners of the world. So the simple garment of a peasant draws together the far corners of the globe in an unconcerted concert of manufacture. And it is the division of labor that's behind this stunning paradoxical colloc and it's the division of labor that's behind this stunning paradoxical collocation and condensation of complexity and a lowly item that is generally beneath notice. Of course, it is left rather opaque here how exactly the sublimity of the commodity system 
buttresses the demonstration of comparative wealth, somehow helping us to see that a lowly workman is richer than an African king. Ultimately, the burden of the argument rests on the presumption that the availability of mass produced objects through globalized commodity production is in itself a form of incomparable wealth. So I'm gonna move on to my second example, which is from, which has to do with Smith's discussion of exchange as the principle behind the foundational principle of the division of labor. So first we might note once again in Smith's drafts that in a kind of proto-Darwinist maneuver, he attributes the social division of labor to the human natural principle of competition, which reintroduces the problem of ranking, only then to revise this explanation with exchange as the driver of the division of labor. So here again, this is from his earlier lectures on jurisprudence. No human prudence is requisite to make this division. We are told indeed that Sesostris made a law that everyone should forever adhere to his father's profession. And the same rule has been made in other Eastern countries. The reason of this constitution was that they feared lest everyone endeavoring to advance himself into what we call a gentlemanly character, the lower trades should be deserted. But in this general scramble for preeminence, when some get up, others must necessarily fall undermost. And these may supply the lower trades as well as any other. The natural course of things will in this manner either give or leave enough hands to the lowest professions. And if things be allowed to take their natural course, there is no great danger that any branch of trade should be either over or understocked with hands. The constitution of Sesostris also did not endeavor to introduce it, but to preserve, did not endeavor to introduce, but to preserve the division of trades, which he without reason was afraid would not be maintained by the causes which had produced it. I showed also how the disposition to truck barter and exchange is the foundation of this division, right? So is it competition or is it the desire to exchange? Um, he has another long passage on this and I'll just look at the very end of it. He says, there must be as many up as down and no division can ever be overstretched. But it is not this which gives occasion to the division of labor. It flows from a direct propensity in human nature for one man to barter with another. So I want to note here that Smith clearly replaces the hierarchical version of the division of labor with a division of labor that involves pure difference, right? The butcher and the baker, <laughs> since that is all that's required for exchange. So this is how Smith, so those were the drafts. This is how Smith introduces exchange in the final text. This division of labor from which so many advantages are derived is not originally the effect of any human wisdom which foresees and intends that general opulence to which it gives occasion. It is the necessary though very slow and gradual consequence of a certain propensity in human nature which has in view no such extensive utility, the propensity to truck, barter and exchange one thing for another. It's easy to see why Smith chose exchange as a human natural principle forming the crux of his system. It provides a mechanism for increasing and distributing society's wealth, making surplus valuable and creating a motive for men to produce it in the first place. While this socially advantageous outcome comes about invisible handedly solely through the pursuit of self-interest. In fact, exchange, at least in the primordial exchange that Smith initially narrates is further paradoxical and that it is always mutually advantageous. Through mutual surrender of, of equal amounts, right? Both parties receive more than they give. And what follows, I may seem like a stickler, trying to nail Smith down on questions of cause and effect. To this, I would respond, <laughs> take note of Smith's own obsession with this in the text and the way he is constantly turning the narrative situation around to figure out what gives rise to what. So about five more minutes here or so. So does exchange give rise to the division of labor or is it the effect of man's interdependency, his labor already always already divided as a species being? So Smith says, and this is in the final version, 
It, in almost every other race of animals, each individual, when it has grown up to maturity, is entirely independent and in its natural state has occasion for the assistance of no other living creature. But man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren. And it is in vain for him to expect it of their benevolence only. He will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favor and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. And he says, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard to their own self-interest. So Smith seems here to illustrate man's proclivity to exchange less to be a factor generating the division of labor than an effect made necessary by it. In this conjectural history, it is impossible to imagine man's survival without this method of suasion. Of course, the philosopher glosses over this apparent contradiction by setting it out as though it were perfectly logical. But then again, Smith also figures humans as primordially self-sufficient, which in turn posits exchange as that which leads to a division of labor. Without the disposition to track barter and exchange, every man must have procured to himself every necessary inconveniency of life which he wanted. So right, it's not that he's so needy, actually he is self-sufficient. So exchange is the only thing that makes him specialize, right? All must have had the same duties to perform and there could have been no such difference of employment. Yet then he also in turn suggests that the production of an adventitious surplus might form the origins of exchange. In a tribe of hunters or shepherds, a certain person makes bows and arrows, for example, with more readiness and dexterity than any other. He frequently exchanges them for cattle or for venison with his companions, and he finds that at last he can, do, he can in this manner get more cattle and venison than if he himself went to the field to catch them. From a regard to his own interest, therefore, the making of bows and arrows grows to be his chief business, and he becomes a sort of armorer. And then finally, he actually rewrites the situation again, <laughs> such that this native talent as the factor enabling exchange is in fact socially acquired in a scenario where exchange is presumed. The difference of natural talents in men is in reality much less than we are aware of. And the very different genius which appears to distinguish men of different professions is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect of the division of labor. As it is this disposition to barter and exchange which forms that difference of talents, so it is this same disposition which renders that difference useful by bringing it as it were into a common stock. So given this firm explanation that innate talent is in fact a necessary acquired social quality so that we have something to exchange, it comes into relief as an admittedly fictitious narrative necessity, something the originary moment of exchange has required, right? Suddenly the person is so great at making arrows and he's the armorer. <laughs> it's something that exchange has required as its motivating impetus, but ever after, it's really the effect of exchange, that talent, right? It's developed out of the social <laughs> need to have something to exchange. In Wealth of Nations, uh, and a, a, just a couple more uh, points on the exchange on exchange here. So in Wealth of Nations, Smith depicts the bargain, the proposal of an exchange in which the self-interest of another is served as a valuably expedient form of argument or persuasion whereby one may get what one needs. Yet he hints in the treatise as well that exchange may be thought of as originarily non-instrumental, that human beings truck and barter not to fulfill material needs but because they are social animals, making the act of exchange an end in itself. In fact, Smith had rather vigorously pursued this line of argument in the early drafts and claims in, that men are driven to persuade each other for persuasion's sake alone. And these are really fun passages actually. Um, <clears throat> If we should inquire into the principle in the human mind on which this disposition of trucking is founded, it is clearly the natural inclination of every, that everyone has to persuade. The offering of a shilling, which to us appears to have so plain and simple a meaning, is in reality offering an argument to persuade one to do so-and-so, as it is for his own interest. Men always endeavor to persuade others to be of their opinion, even when the matter is of no consequence to them, 
if one advances anything concerning China or the more distant moon, which contradicts what you imagine to be true, you immediately try to persuade him to alter his opinion. And in this manner, everyone is practicing oratory on others through the whole of his life. One, one more uh, quote here. In this manner, they acquire a certain dexterity and address in managing their affairs, or in other words, in managing of men. And this altogether, the practice of every man in the most ordinary affairs. This being the constant employment or trade of every man, in the same manner as artisans invent simple methods of doing their work, so will each one here endeavor to do this work in the simplest manner. And so the simplest manner of persuading someone is offering them something in exchange that engages their self-interest. That is bartering, which by which they address themselves to the self-interest of the person and seldom fail immediately to gain their end. So here oratory um, becomes both the most basic of intersubjective ties and the structure uniting them all. It is, as Smith further specifies, at core a purely symbolic behavior in which man exercises a will to dominate. In other words, one does not persuade because one wants to exchange, one exchanges because one wants to persuade. And so this is, this. I'm wrapping up here. So this is a final quote we'll look at on this same topic. So in another draft, Smith emphasizes that bargaining develops invisible handedly as a ready method serving an underlying human, human natural passional need to convert others. So he says, the real foundation of this disposition to barter is that principle to persuade which so much prevails in human nature. When any arguments are offered to persuade, it is always expected that they should have their proper effect if a person asserts anything about the moon, though it should not be true, he will feel a kind of uneasiness in being contradicted and would be very glad that the person he is endeavoring to persuade should be of the same way of thinking with himself. We ought then mainly to cultivate the power of persuasion and indeed we do so without intending it. Since a whole life is spent in the exercise of it, a ready method of bargaining with each other must undoubtedly be attained. Um, so, let's see, I'll stop, I'll stop sharing here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here. I, I um, have written another part of this talk, which was basically about um, Marx, uh, Marx's discussion in Capital of the vicious circularity of the capitalist system, which, um, so capitalism produces surplus, right? It, it is that which produces surplus and yet it requires an enormous amount of stock in order to operate. So if it's that which produces surplus, how do you um, get the, the presupposed surplus with which it starts? And um, he actually attributes a sort of uh, false, a false rationalization of the system to Smith and um, uh, to Smith. And Smith, in fact, is entirely aware of that vicious uh, causality. And he ends up actually just skipping it and not narrating it in the um, book two of The Wealth of Nations, which is actually really, really interesting. Um, I mean, there's just a big hole in the narrative. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly you're in capitalist society and it's like, wait a minute, why does someone have this whole stock and a, a means to um, <laughs> pay laborers? And why do these laborers have nothing? And that's just not explained. Um, and he and he says as much. It's not really possible. How do you how do you get the stock required without the division of labor? Um, right? It's just not it's just not possible. Um, so anyway, I I will end there. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>